those of us who uh, may be joining today for the first time, welcome. For those of you who, who haven't been with us um, for very long, welcome to you as well. And I say that because we are continuing in our series in Revelation. We've been in a series in the book of Revelation since last June. And we are powering through it. We have a few more chapters to go. We're almost at the end. Uh, Jesus is coming soon. Amen. He's coming soon. Literally, he's coming soon. He's coming in the next chapter. Okay, he's coming back. So, so we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, this is our series within our series, right? The Tribulation, Terror and Triumph. And we're looking at the final part. Part 10, Babylon from Wealth to Waste is the title of the message for today. I want you to think about the term religious devotion. Think about that term. What are the pictures that come to mind? For you, when we, when we hear the term religious devotion, it's probably something like this, right? People praying in a church or a temple, missionaries in a remote place in the world, or perhaps a congregation singing together passionately. The scripture reveals something that we need to know. In the very last days, the very last days, there will be a religion of an entirely new order that will permeate the earth. And the images that best represent that coming religion, and I say religion loosely, and we'll look at it, it's in a sense a religion. It will be an entirely new one. And it will look a lot more like Wall Street than it will the walls of a church. In fact, I like this picture because it looks like that guy's literally preaching with his mic in the middle of Wall Street with his iPad. He looks inspired too. Right? You know, during my seminary studies, I once did a project on the theology of shopping malls. It was part of my theology and culture class, and it was a really interesting study for me as I walked around literally and did this research and took a lot of pictures and, and thought about this deeply, the theology of shopping malls. Now I know malls aren't as popular nowadays as they once were, but I believe what I found in my study many years ago still holds true. Think about this. The mall is basically a nice, clean, large building where people gather often on a Sunday morning or a Sunday afternoon, and they're there to worship. Not in a religious sense, of course, but worship in the sense of giving their affection, right? Giving their affection to themselves and what they're purchasing for themselves, or giving their affection to a certain celebrity that endorses a product that they're so longing to get for themselves. They come to worship material goods. They're offering. They give offering. Their offering is the tap of a credit card or the swipe of a credit card. And hopefully they'll hear some nice songs while they're there too, right? And then walk away, leave the building, hopefully feeling a little better about themselves. Doesn't that sound like the average experience of a churchgoer these days? Hear some nice songs, feel a little better about yourself when you leave, give your offering, you know, move on with life. It's interesting. Um, because the parallels between the mall and the church are, 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 are there. And as time goes on, those parallels will only get stronger to the extent where at one point, especially in the Great Tribulation, those parallel lines will become one line. It will become a religion led by Antichrist that is the religion of commerce, a religion of massive materialism. And luxury. This will be the hallmark of the coming Babylon. Of the coming Babylon. Today we're going to close out our study on the tribulation period as we come to chapter 18 of this great book. And that being said, I think this is a good time for us to, to take a step back. And for, especially for those who haven't been part of our series from the beginning and you're just coming into Revelation 18, perhaps for the first time here in our series, this hopefully will be helpful to you as well as we kind of take a step back and, and look at some of the things that, that we've, kind of a summary, if you will, of what we've learned so far about the events in Revelation, hopefully bring us up to speed a little bit. First of all, let's start with this. The book of Revelation was written by who? Apostle, say it, Apostle 
John, I think is what you said, right? Apostle John, good, let's start there. All right, so Revelation written by Apostle John around AD 95 while he was exiled on the Greek island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. It's the last book in the canon of scripture, both in terms of the date of its writing and also in terms of its order. It's the last book in the canon of scripture, last book of the Bible. And written somewhere about 60 years about about 60 years after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we were to simplify the arrangement of, of the book, the earlier chapters of Revelation are in a sense the historical writings of Revelation. Remember we read and learned about the seven letters Jesus uh, gave to the churches in Asia Minor at that time. Uh, these were historical churches, historical letters written for that specific period of time, but there was a message for churches of all time, as we learned. But that's the historical section of Revelation, the first three chapters, if you will. And that's a, it's a very, I'm really generalizing it today, but just, just so we know, I mean, basically we can call the first three chapters a historical section of Revelation. And as we move on to chapters four and five, for those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, which many evangelicals believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. In other words, that all Christians who live at the time just prior to the tribulation will literally be raptured to be with Jesus prior to the tribulation period, prior to all of those judgments, that the Christians, the church at that time will be raptured. Now, I personally don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture because I don't believe that's what the Revelation clearly teaches. But there's a lot of evangelicals who do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Some of you in, in, our, in our ministry, in our church, believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And that's totally fine. I mean, it's, it's not an area that we need to be divided over because we really, at the end, don't really know for sure. I, I believe we don't know for sure. If it happens, praise God, right? But that's, that's what's going to happen basically after chapter 3. So if there is a pre-tribulation rapture, it happens after chapter 3. Then chapters 4 and 5 are like an interlude. An interlude into this whole 10 part series that we've been doing on the tribulation. So, four and five are the interlude. Chapters 6 through 18 really are talking about the seven year tribulation period, the latter three and a half years being called the Great Tribulation. So, what we've been looking at these last several months really are these achronological visions Apostle John had of the tribulation. And again, we have to remember, Revelation 6 through 18 is not in chronological order. Okay, it's just a series of visions that Apostle John was receiving. God was giving him pieces to the puzzle of what's going to happen during the tribulation period. Okay, so they actually overlap in terms of the timing. They're not in chronological order. Daniel chapter 9 is the original prophecy of this seven-year tribulation. Again, the first three and a half years, the, the tribulation, and the final three and a half years being the great tribulation. Then, chapter 19 is when Jesus returns. That's next chapter, all right? We're almost there. Chapter 19, Jesus returns. He establishes his millennial reign, his thousand-year reign upon the earth with the church, the final defeat of Satan and evil at the end of that period, and the great white throne judgment. This is the final judgment that we've all heard of for a very long time in the church as every human soul gives an account of their lives before the great judge, Jesus Christ. Those who rebelled against him and remained in sin will be subject to an eternity in hell, separated from God. And those who trusted in him will be ushered into their eternal joy in the new heavens and new earth. There's the book of Revelation in five minutes. Any questions? Are we okay so far? Now, I know all of you followed that to a T, but in case any of you are a little tired today, and just kind of like, just literally as I'm talking, I look like just my mouth is moving and nothing's happening cognitively, just remember two words, okay? Jesus wins. Right? If you don't remember anything else from this entire book, or even today's message, just remember, Jesus wins. All right. Now, with this larger framework in mind, the visions that we read today in chapter 18 are largely at the end of this seven-year tribulation period, really at the end of the story. 
And as we noted last week, when we looked at Revelation chapter 17, it, it was the prophetic uh, vision of a literal future Babylon 2.0. The re-emergence of the city of Babylon that will become the capital of the entire world. That's what Revelation 17 makes very clear to us. Now, here's some Bible trivia that you might find very interesting. This well, ancient Babylon was located somewhere in southern Iraq, modern day southern Iraq. Okay. The Garden of Eden. Is most was most likely located somewhere in southern Iraq. We know that from the Euphrates River and the Tigri River that's spoken of in the earlier part of Genesis as to where the Garden of Eden was. It's not a garden anymore. Okay, it's, it's wasteland. It's desert now. Okay, in southern Iraq. But that's where the Garden of Eden most likely was located. And if you think about it, that's essentially kind of like the center of the world. So the Garden of Eden, where creation began, where, where really the whole story began, and the Babylon that will come in the tribulation are located in the same place. The story will begin, and the story will end in what we know as southern Iraq. Really interesting stuff there, right? So what happens here? God begins to pour out his judgments um, in the tribulation period. And in this first three and a half years, as initially the seal judgments are poured out, you know, judgment has begun. But someone is going to arise in that period. It's actually the first seal judgment. There's going to be the rise of a very charismatic figure known as Antichrist, the Antichrist, capital A, whose initial platform will be the promise of world peace. So everyone will know something crazy is happening in the world. Judgments are starting to fall and these catastrophic things are starting to happen. People are going to know something weird is going on. And in that period, Antichrist will arise and will promise safety, security, wealth, peace in that time. And because of that, we'll gain a large following. In fact, it will be so large that it will be the entire world that will begin to follow Antichrist. His influence will grow very, very quickly and in a very just vast, just crazy, massive influence that he will have as people grow increasingly rebellious against God. It's all going to happen, a perfect storm at the same time. And the future city that will be the capital, the center of all of this, will be this future Babylon that will arise. But what did we learn at the end here? At the end, there will be, as we learned about last week, this, this new world religion that will essentially take over the entire world. There will be this one global religion, a religion that hates God, a religion that hates Christianity, a religion that seeks to murder and destroy Christians, and it will only grow and grow and grow until it becomes actually the religion of the entire world. I won't say it, but any, some, all of us in this room might be able to guess what that world religion may end up being as time goes on. Okay, scripture doesn't say it's the religion of Islam. I just said it. Um, so this is just me. Okay, this is not what the scriptures say. But when we look at the trajectory of Islam and its growth in the world and its hatred specifically towards Judaism and Christianity, I think we know what might happen in the end. Islam may actually become a global religion and take over the world. But what do we, what do we hear? Now, Islam's not the enemy. Islam is the medium of the enemy. The enemy is Satan. He's going to use religion as really the first part of his world takeover. That's the harlot we learned about last Sunday, the harlot. This great world religion that's going to take place here. And we saw it in Revelation chapter 17. But what do we see at the end? What do we see at the end of Revelation 17? What's going to happen to the harlot? Do you re recall? The harlot will actually be destroyed from within. Why? Antichrist and the Ten Kingdom Confederation that we learned about last Sunday 
will actually, Scripture says, prophesies, will destroy the harlot. So here's what I believe is going to, what Scripture is, is telling us through that. Antichrist will rise in influence and power. And one of the primary ways he will do it is through the use of religion. Is through the use potentially of a religion like Islam. To grow in world prominence, wealth, authority, until he reaches that point. And when he reaches that point where he's literally taken over the world, at that point he will no longer need that religion to gain more prominence for himself. He will be essentially the God of the world. So he will actually eradicate that religion because all that he needed from it is now his. Does that make sense? It won't be the first time someone has used religion to gain much power, authority, and wealth. The Antichrist will be the master of doing that at the end. And what will happen is once religion is essentially eradicated from the earth, there will be this completely new world order of religion. It won't be about praying and singing and you know this, this devotional stuff that we think about in the traditional sense. This new world order, this world religion will be in the form of commerce. That will be the new world order. It's exactly what will happen. We need to be aware of it. We need to know what's coming. Luxury, prestige, wealth, comfort, material goods, all of those will be Satan's way of destroying everything and setting himself up as God through the Antichrist. That brings us to our passage. This is from Revelation chapter 18. Scripture says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. We can't read the whole thing. I wish we could. It's kind of a long chapter. We're just going to summarize it here. Chapter 18 describes the world, the state of the world, during the tribulation period. Again, though God's judgments are beginning to fall upon the earth, He will still give sinners time to repent during that period and be saved. And some will be saved. But many will turn away and rebel further against God and will go hard after wealth, go hard after financial security, go hard after material things, luxuries. They will go hard after it as a way of, in a sense, kind of trying to hide from this judgment that's coming. And this future Babylon will be like this oasis that will provide that for everyone who desires it. The passage describes this enterprise as demonic in every way. The dwelling place of demons in a prison of every unclean spirit. The most powerful brand at that time will not be Amazon.com. It will be Hades Inc. Okay, Hades Incorporated will be like the global brand, right? If we think if we think Satan has control over modern media now, it will only be infinitely worse at that time. Imagine the television commercials and the news at that time. It's, it's unimaginable, actually. Verse 3 declared, The kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. This language of immorality and sensuality clearly reference the demonic lust of mankind for wealth and riches. And this imagery of seduction, it's no accident here, as that reflects the state 
of the sinful heart at its climax. Now think about it. If we had nothing holding us back, if our sinful nature was left to just run wild, what would happen? In our greed, we would just destroy ourselves. Just constantly wanting more and more and more for ourselves. We would literally destroy ourselves, seduced by this world system. And that will be the heart of man in the time of this final battle under the reign of Antichrist. But as the angel declared, what happens here? Babylon will be fallen, judged, destroyed. In fact, it could be that the last judgment, the seventh bold judgment, may be the one that actually destroys Babylon. Because it, it, back in Revelation 16, it, it talks about how Babylon will be remembered before God. To give her the cup of his fierce wrath is what scripture says. So again, God will bring judgment, destroy the evil empire of Antichrist here in chapter 18. And here's what's interesting. Verse 9 declares that the kings of the earth that enjoy these riches will weep loudly and lament as they see the destruction of Babylon right before their eyes. They won't be weeping in repentance before God. They won't, be, they won't be weeping at the state of their sinful hearts. No, they will be weeping because their God, which is riches and luxury, will be no more. That's why they'll be weeping. If you own something that would make you weep if you had to let it go, we may need to check our hearts. Right? Now, let me, let me say that, of course, if, if we lost our home, you, you probably would cry. I mean, that would be devastating, right? Or, or lost a family heirloom, or something with a lot of value like that or meaning. Yes, I, I, I get that. We would probably weep if that were to happen. But I'm talking about more frivolous things. If there's something you own that you would literally be weeping if, if you were to let it go, if it got lost or stolen, then... It could very well be that you don't own it, but it probably owns you. Something that we just need to check our hearts over, right? That's what those kings will be doing. And later in verse 19, it says the wealthy merchants will, will mourn with sackcloth and ashes, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she has been laid waste from wealth to waste. Now, we've all felt the effects of the backup at the ports. Amen? Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if this has to do with the ports. But my family really likes eating bagels and cream cheese in the morning. Have any of you noticed? You can't find cream cheese anywhere. It's like the weirdest thing. Every time I go to get cream, it's gone. Like, it's like what is going on with cream cheese? It's like the weirdest thing. I know, you know, not just that, but like, you know, there's so much going on at the ports. There's such a backup that, that you literally can't find stuff nowadays. We've all felt the effects of that. Well, in this future Babylon, what this what the passage is declaring is that there will be a massive shipping system where all Babylon's goods will be distributed throughout the world through this massive system of trade through, through the sea, right? Through these massive ships that will deliver the goods. So it talks about how the merchants of the sea will be lamenting, weeping. They will see that the riches, the system they built their life upon was crumbling right before their eyes. And the verse says that they will mourn over the, over the loss of Babylon as if they are mourning the loss of a de dead person, the loss of a loved one. It says they will mourn with dust and ashes. They will actually be mourning as if they're mourning over the death of a loved one, like they're going to be mourning over the loss of their goods. That's what's going to happen. They know the judgment they were running away from is coming soon. And they won't be able to escape it. All right, then. What does all this mean for us? Let's turn to one of Apostle John's earlier epistles, 1 John chapter 2. Verses 15 through 17, this is God's message for us. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. In other words, everything that's happening in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. It's not from the Father. It's from the world. The world is passing away. And also its lusts. Yet yeah, sure will. Revelation 18 makes that clear. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. If you read between the lines here. 1 John 2, Revelation 18. What is clear is this. Our sinful flesh does love the world. Doesn't it? Our sinful nature. It does love the world. The allure of comfort, luxury, pleasure, wealth. In our sinful nature, we're like, amen to those. Yeah, I'll take some of that, right? All of that comes down to one thing, doesn't it? Idolatry. Idolatry. Which is arguably the worst sin that's plagued mankind from the beginning of time. I mean, you look back at the... At the at the, the Old Testament and the, what happened with the Israelites, what was their number one vice? What what really brought them down? It was the sin of idolatry. It plagued them. It led to their failures and their subsequent judgments. And when you read the Old Testament, you look through this and you're like, oh, well, it's a different time, you know, different situation, very different people. Let's remember something: the sinful nature has one DNA. It's something we all share. And it doesn't look that different between one person or another. Sin is sin. And when we read of sin in the Old Testament, when we read of the failures of the Israelites in the Old Testament, we are reading of our story. They represent us. It's the same sinful nature. You know, one of the best definitions of idolatry I've heard is from Pastor John Piper. Who noted this, idolatry starts in the heart. Craving, wanting, enjoying, being satisfied by anything that you treasure more than God. That cuts to the heart. Because when you read that, there's not a single one of us in this room that can honestly say that we don't struggle deeply with idolatry. We are all idolaters. We are an idolatrous people. There are so many things we enjoy and treasure more than God at times. We're all guilty of this. You know, the Christian life on one hand is a constant struggle of being in the world but not of the world, right? But on the other hand, it's the only life that offers true freedom from the seduction and imprisonment of the idolatrous system of the world. Because in Christianity, we, we know the truth that we can live in the freedom of enjoying the blessings God has given us while never having to find our identity in those blessings or constantly chase after more of them. We don't have to do that because we found something greater, something more eternal. We have the freedom to use wealth the way it was always meant to be used, to honor and further the kingdom of God. So Revelation 18 is a warning to both believers and unbelievers of the final outcome of this world with all its shiny goods. Put simply, it's all going to burn up. It's all going to be destroyed in the end. You know, the pictures are still clear in my mind of the Saddle Ridge fire. Any of us remember the Saddle Ridge Fire? It wasn't that long ago. October 2019. Those of us who live in like the Porter Ranch area or North Valley remember how, how massive that was, how destructive it was. The images, the tragic images in my head are still so fresh. Those homes burnt to the ground. Cars burnt to the ground, destroyed. Possessions, all of it tragically gone. It just gives me just a, a, a very, very, very small glimpse of what will happen on, on, on a global scale in Revelation 18 when God judges Babylon. We can all try to run and hide from the coming judgment, chasing after material things as a way of distraction or a way of escape. And Christians are guilty of this too, chasing after these things. But deep down inside, all of us know 
They're all temporary. And as we chase after these things and anything else that takes our eyes off of God, the clock is still ticking. The judgment is still coming. We can't run or hide from the judge of the world. And so what did our, the judge of the world do in his mercy? He gave us another option. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus offers us another option. We don't have to run from the judge. We can run to the judge. And in fact, when we do that, we realize that the judge is also the Savior running toward us. Not to condemn, but to embrace, to forgive, and to give us something greater that the world cannot offer. There is no true security in the world, is there? So where is your hope? Where is our hope? It's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our identity, our security, our purpose, our fulfillment in the Savior who gave his life to give us life. So let's close with two simple applications to help us. First, Apostle Paul declared this in Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Yeah, that's right, because that's what's going to happen in Revelation 17 and 18. Indeed, God will impart his wrath upon those who continue to live in idolatry and rebellion against him. And he noted specifically here the areas of idolatry that plague our souls the most. Immorality, which is sexual immorality, pornography, fornication, marital unfaithfulness. Those things will lead to judgment and death. Impurity, which is compromise with sin. Passion, which is another word for anger. Evil desire, coveting that which dishonors God. And greed, this constant pursuit for more. Let's take an honest look at our hearts. Are we guilty of those things? In one form or another, all of us are. And God's not condemning us for it. He is giving us this word as a reminder to wake up. Wake up. Know that the blood of Jesus has covered those things. So stop walking in them. Wake up, because those who practice these things will be destroyed to eternal judgment. God is warning us. In his love and his mercy, wake up! As God's children, let's fight the good fight to put these sins to death in our lives. If we couldn't do it, God wouldn't command us to do it. We can through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can just continue to cut them off from our lives. That's the good fight of faith. Cut off the things that entangle our souls. You know, amputation is not a pleasant reality, but it is a powerful one. Sometimes we need to literally remove the things that can poison us, that can infect us, not just physically, but spiritually, so that we can keep walking in the freedom that God has for us when we honor Him in these areas of our lives. God wants us to walk in freedom. Freedom. Not imprisoned and entangled by sin, but in freedom. So first application is, we need to come before God, surrender and identify those things in our lives that shackle us and entangle us into those areas we read about in Colossians 3. And bring them before the Lord and ask the Lord for the strength to cut them off. Cut them off. Secondly, if Apostle Paul declared... 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy 6. It's the last passage we'll look at. He says this. This is awesome. But godliness actually is a means 
of great gain when accompanied by, let's say it together, accompanied by contentment. Let's say it again, accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. That's right. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish desires, harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Here's a second point of application. Learn contentment. The discipline of contentment is so powerful. It gives us so much freedom and focus in our walk with Christ. And it protects us from ruin and destruction. Listen, we all know what this is like. When we are constantly chasing the upgrade, it's really such an all-consuming quest, isn't it? Literally, you're sitting there for hours in front of your computer or your phone, your laptop, your tablet, just doing research on end, looking at reviews, wondering, will this one work? Will that one work? You know, uh, let's try this one. If it doesn't work out, we return it and get a different one. It's this all-consuming pursuit when we're just chasing the upgrade. And isn't that exactly what the world wants us to do? Chasing the upgrade. That's, it, that's The whole machine works like that, doesn't it? And it just enslaves us. It's like, it's like we're walking into a prison cell and locking the door ourselves and just voluntarily walking in. That's what we do. Or we're constantly chasing the upgrade, constantly on our minds, takes up our time, wastes our money. You know, it even destroys the environment because of all those Amazon packages you keep getting. You know, it's just destroying the environment. You know, all that stuff. Come on, sustainability, people. We know it's important, right? Right, all that stuff. It's just, it's just craziness. Now, I'm not saying you can't order stuff on Amazon. Right? Of course, you, know, you can, and many of us do. All right? It just is what it is. But, you know, there's a certain point. When you start seeing the boxes piling up, and you don't even know what it is, come on now. I'm preaching to somebody today. You don't even know what it is because you get so much stuff. I'm preaching to myself, too. What is this? Oh, oh, yeah. Sometimes it's for church, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I ordered that for church. But it's not always for church. Well, we all know what that's like. But practicing contentment frees us from all of this. It really does. So we can be focused on serving the purpose of God. Brothers and sisters, let's live within our means. Let's live within our means. If you're enslaved by credit card debt, that is something you need to bring before the Lord and be disciplined to get rid of that. We, we need to live within our means. Appreciate what we have and use it well. Appreciate what we have and use it well. Free ourselves from the rabbit hole of materialism. Get rid of the clutter. Get rid of the clutter. I mean, how many of us have garages that you can't park your car in because there's too much stuff in there? I mean, that's like the average home. It's like that. Three-car garage, you can only fit one car in there if you're lucky, right? I mean, just get rid of the clutter. Some of us need to just leave this, leave today after this message, go home, and just get rid of a bunch of stuff. And that would be the most spiritual thing you've done all year. Like, seriously. Just get rid of the clutter, and don't buy more stuff to replace it, okay? That's, that's, that's not, that doesn't make sense to do that. All right, get rid of the clutter. You will be amazed sometimes just seeing just space, literally seeing physical space, it is like spiritually renewing. Like you, you look at it and just your mind is clear, right? You feel a burden lifted. All right, some of us just need to do that. Get rid of the clutter. Simplify. Give things away. You know, sell stuff. And use that money toward, you know, blessing the kingdom of God or something, right? Just free yourself from the perpetual temptation for more, for more. 
Why all this? Because we know what's coming. We know the system the enemy is using to destroy the world and to gain authority over the entire globe. He's going to use a system of materialism. He's going to use the Antichrist to lead a one world system that will be blinding people into thinking that luxury, wealth, pleasure, and goods will make them happy. In the end, it will lead to their destruction. We know what the enemy is going to use. So let's be aware, even now. Let's live lives that are content. Amen? Lives of contentment. Lives of contentment. Just being thankful for what God has given us. Freeing ourselves from the constant need to chase for more. Now, there are opportunities. Maybe God will open a door to expand our boundaries. And, and that will happen sometimes. And we need to pray through those things and, and walk through them and make wise decisions in those moments. But as in general, let's let go of that need for more. Let's learn contentment so that our hearts and our souls will be protected from ruin and destruction so that we can walk in freedom and focus as we serve God in our generation. Let's pray together.